You guys, Ron Moorhead is on the show today. And oh my gosh, is it going to get weird? We are going to talk about the Bigfoot, UFO connection, alien, human, DNA manipulation, ancient aliens, quantum physics, invisible Bigfoot. Like I said, it's going to get weird. The longer you stick around for this episode, the weirder it's going to get. But you don't want to miss a single second because Ron Moorhead is a legend. And if you don't know who he is, you're going to know after this episode. And as always, welcome to the Weird Wilderness you're the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Ron Moorhead. <laughs> Welcome to the Weird I, Wilderness. I really appreciate you able to change the time for me. I got oh, that mixed up on the calendar. I had it right here, but on the calendar, I had a different time. So That's okay. I reserve this day just for you. So. Oh, oh. <laughs> so welcome. I'm really excited to talk to you about some of your adventures, kind of where your story begins there are still people who don't know anything about the sierra sounds which blows my mind and i'm sure that's a mission for you to kind of raise that awareness and tell people about it so i would love to hear kind of where that all started so if you want to start from the beginning well it started with me and some other guys some friends of mine uh in a a remote hunting camp in the sierra nevada california in 1971, and uh, I was 29 then, so gives you a little idea how long I've been doing this. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, the guys were, I was not a hunter at the time, but they were all, it's a hunting camp. They weren't looking for Bigfoot. And uh, the two Johnson brothers came out and said they had something going on at camp, uh, left a big footprint. And the other guys, which I was friends with them all, but uh, they all went up to see what kind of bear or what kind of monster it was. and one of the guys got scared off when he heard the sounds and he wouldn't go back. So they all didn't come out when they were supposed to. The wives were all worried because they didn't know if the guys got eaten up or what, you know, they just didn't know because it's really a strange thing. The camp, uh, Johnson brothers have been using the camp since 1958. So they were very aware of uh, the area. It's eight miles in the wilderness, 8,400 feet in elevation. So very imposing area to get to. Not easy to get to. Not at all. all. <laughs> Not at all. No, I had a few broken ribs <laughs> my horse going up there oh gosh went off, <laughs> off the cliffs or something uh anyway uh the guy wouldn't go back without somebody going with him it just frightened him so much very religious person he didn't know where to put that in his in his thinking well none of us did really but i went up with him and that's how i got started and then i started hunting after that and uh, that's how i got started we started going back and taking tape recorders and i went back as often as i could uh, so uh that's how i got started and then uh, yeah. it wasn't until the winter of 72 when we got snowed out in uh, Albury, we contacted uh, a guy named uh, Ivan Sanderson, cryptozoologist, and he uh, got a 23-page letter from Warren Johnson telling him all about what was going on up there, the encounters we had, and they were coming back. And the guy thought he was uh, pulling his leg, he, but he sent it off to Peter Byrne out in the West Coast, who had a research center there. And Peter uh, thought the same thing. And he sent it down to Al Berry, and Al Berry thought the same thing, because I didn't know any of this. I read the correspondence with him years later. <laughs> they were all talking about how, if you want to check this out, go ahead, but it's probably a hoax. <laughs> so Al, Al went up there with a master's degree in science, very uh, very intelligent guy. He uh, he was looking for a hoax, and uh, he uh, couldn't find one. He was looking around. I didn't know it, but he was searching our bags when we were out walking, and he was just trying to find out who could be pulling this off way back there and not leaving any signs other than their tracks. and is allowing us to record them. So Al Berry actually fostered the sounds uh, at the University of Wyoming, fostered the study of the sounds at the University of Wyoming uh, in 1976, I think it was. He went to uh, the people that had studied the Nixon tapes first, and uh, they gave a little report, which he wrote about in his book. Uh, and then uh, he finally found a, a professor at the University of Wyoming named Dr. Curlin. And Dr. Curlin uh, took him on seriously. He said, I just want to know if he's if this is real or if it's not. So Dr. Curlin studied it for a year and gave a report at the Anthropology Unknown in British Columbia. And that was uh, that was very unique, but it wasn't enough to get academia on board with it. Even though he's a professor, wrote several papers, he said, compared to a, the, the sounds they gave compared to a human vocal, uh, vocal track is, it represents an animal over eight foot tall. Yet that didn't capture everybody's attention, even though he's a professor, uh, renowned, really. So uh, 
went on, and it wasn't until 2008 until uh, uh, a guy named uh, Scott Nelson got a hold of him by accident. He's a crypto linguist trained by the Navy to uh, study sounds and codes and see if there's any discrepancies in them or any, uh, oh, uh, any hoaxing or something. He could identify that stuff. He's a two-time graduate of the uh, DOD, uh, which is now the Institute's part of it. So anyway, uh, I got a letter uh, verifying him, vetting him, and he's uh, very credible. So that put it over another ledge because he says they have a, a, a language by the human definition of language. And that means a vocal, uh, a vocal system that creates shaping thought or into words like we're doing now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we got any questions? Just break yeah, in here and ask yeah. <laughs> I would, I would love to for you to share the the night that those sounds were captured. Can you take us through that, just for anybody who is unfamiliar? And what I'll do is um, I'll include the sounds, you know, in post production. I'll include that so people can hear that. But just, I guess, you know, from the moment w leading up to the recordings and kind of while that was all going on, can you take me through? Well, briefly, uh, I can, because it wasn't just one night. It was nights over a few years. Yeah. So we went up, I went up there many, 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 many. Every chance I got, I'd go up there. And so we was all recording them. Al Berry was going up as much as he could, but he lived quite a ways away. He couldn't go up quite as much. But the sounds he captured... Uh, were the ones that were studied and uh, they were uh, shown to be uh, outside the human range and inside the human range. So people can say things that these things are saying, but they can't reach the depths of range that these things get to. Right. It's and, both and so, uh, above mm -hmm. and below, correct? Like it's correct. Yeah. I, 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 I believe they can use infrasound. They can, they can make sounds. Because we've heard sounds up there just have no, no reasonable answer to them. And uh, you'd think that one time we thought our camp was being tore apart and we look out there later and nothing's changed. Well, that didn't make sense to us. But what do you do with that stuff? You know, we weren't yeah. thinking in terms of anything. So the question is, the sound that you're hearing of the camp being torn up, is it mimicking the sound or is something actually happening in more of like a quantum <laughs> realm? There's your question. Yeah. So we're still looking for that answer. <laughs> we don't know because yeah. we didn't see him do it. We just didn't. And uh, it was inside our shelter, which is a makeshift uh, bunch of trees in a circle where you wrap cable around and clean deadfall up about it. And it was inside the shelter. So we yeah. let them do whatever they were going to do. But every time you tried to jump out and see what was going on, if you had the guts to do that, uh, they'd be gone just like that. So you recently published a book called Quantum Bigfoot, which I loved it. I am one of those people that don't know exactly where it fits, whether it's, you know, physical, biological creature, a being, or if it has the ability to also move through time and space. And to me, the fact that skeptics often say, you know, we... Why haven't we found bodies? Why can't we get them on camera? Yeah. Why, you know, for all those skeptics, what would you tell them? I got those answers. <laughs> okay, let's talk about those answers. <laughs> Actually, I'm writing another book right now. It's going to detail that stuff out. Okay. It's, it's going to give the science behind it. My first book, Voices in the Wilderness, is my chronicle. And it comes with a download of the sound so you can hear the sound I'm talking about when I get to the context of it. This book it kind of answers the uh, some of the enigmas associated with these things, because it's not just what I just told you, there's many, many things happened up there that we just couldn't explain with classical science. So I got into quantum physics, but then academia, normally they're the classical academia, they stay within the parameters of teachings, mm -hmm. and that's Newtonian physics, which is 1687. Quantum science is uh, relatively new, it's only a little over 100 years old. And uh, so, you know, the, this question, can they disappear? Because I've heard people say, oh, I saw them disappear. I saw them disappear. I heard this. I used to throw those people out with the baby water like researchers do. You know, they just can't. Nothing can just disappear. I just say, well, yes, something can. Plus, you find out that, that energy and matter are interchangeable. Yeah. And that's been, that's been determined by Dr. Dirac. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize for Antimatter in 1933. And Einstein said that, you know, energy and matter are interchangeable. 
So can they disappear? Well, if they could change their matter into energy, that would give that would cause them to come out of our go out of our perception, and uh, that would also cause their trackways to stop, which you hear over and over from people I have mm-hmm. for years. But uh, I had that happen to me. The trackway stopped up there once, and we couldn't find out how where where it went at all. And that was right after a sighting. We found this trackway. So it's just kind of a been a puzzle for a lot of people how these things do what they do how long have they been here you know we tend to think we're the king kong on this uh, planet not not anything else but these things have been here i think a lot longer than us i gotta say some of them because i don't think they're all the same at all yeah well and i think you hear about you know even like the natives the native americans have had stories I actually um, was digging into some old like newspaper articles and found articles that go back to uh, the mid 1800s of different reports. And they, you know, they called it something else. They called it like wild man of the woods. And I found one that um, detailed like the capture of one and two cubs. And this was in the 1840s. And I mean, obviously it goes back even further than, than that, but it would be crazy to think that they haven't been around for a very 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 long time a long 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 <laughs> time yeah. yeah i think maybe they've even been here longer than we have than I, than us. yeah history. i would and maybe I they've would. evolved more because i think we have a lot of attributes that we have not evolved into yeah as human as human beings so yeah i think uh and huffington post came out with an article uh 2012 that it dug up and it said it was about a Eureka Times, 1888. That's how a uh, rancher and several Native Americans saw this uh, moon coming down and three crazy bears jumped out of it. Well, that was the first UFO Bigfoot sighting. And now you find out there's about 20% of uh, Bigfoot sightings have a UFO component to them. And yeah. I saw a UFO there once up at our camp. Uh, yeah, you mentioned the blue ball of light. And yeah. then you have a separate incident when your wife was there and the the kind of the beam of light it's almost like the lightsaber light yeah that well. was in 2016 didn't know what to think about that it just come floating by our tent and i mean <laughs> i said you gotta look at this because had an open tent a nice night out and here comes this light uh, <clears throat> beam just floating by us and we watched it for quite a while till it just went out of sight did it seem to have like a like almost like a sentience? Did it seem to interact with you in any way? Was did it not interact? You? It could care less that we were even there. It sounded it looked like I mean, just come floating by. Maybe it was sensing something. I don't know what, but, but it was definitely uh, intelligence. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it can't just go through the trees like that and, and not hit them or something without thinking. But yeah, it's energy. It's just a form of energy. I think orbs are a form of energy, and that's mm-hmm. what. They were seen up there quite a few times too. Yeah. But I, I don't, I get where I, uh, nothing really surprises me when I get up there because it's just one of those places, you know? Yeah. <laughs> nothing surprises me that I hear from people anymore either since I got into quantum physics because, you know, Newtonian physics, uh, which everybody lives by because we're in a three dimensional world, right? And that three dimensional world uh, has its parameters of light and light's a frequency. According to Tesla and physicists, everything is energy, frequency, and vibration. Well, if you get into that, uh, the frequency of light is 120 to 770 terahertz. That's all the frequency we can see. But there's all these other frequencies going on that we don't see. Yet some people get a glimpse of it once in a while, or you'll, something will happen where you get a glimpse into those other frequencies. Uh, animals a lot, a lot of times can see better than we can. So mm-hmm. I just say well, that there's more going on than what we can see with our eyes. Yeah, so I'm curious, what are your thoughts on why that place in particular? Why does that place have, why is the activity uh, happening there? You know, Heidi, I don't know. <laughs> it's just maybe a portal there. Uh, I just don't know. I, what do you uh, think contributes not, to the portal? Just, well, <laughs> magnetic anomaly somewhere, or, or they can create it themselves, I'm not yeah. sure. Uh, but there's less spots like that all over. You know, I was just at a, a meeting here last weekend in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, a Native uh, officer who is a Native American, but he worked as a law enforcement on the reservation there. And it's a common thing. He's been there for 35 years to see UFOs and Bigfoot and stuff like that. He says it's 
lot of reports and very credible people were there at this uh, meeting I was at. It was a kickoff to David Pilates, uh, uh, the UFO Connection 411. Was, yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to checking that out. Too. Yeah, I got to see it. Oh, very cool. <laughs> I would recommend <laughs> it. Yeah, it's going to help people cross the bridge a little bit because uh, I think there is a UFO component to these things. Yeah. But, uh, that's not to say that some of them aren't just a relic hominid. I want to get this clear because so many people think there's just one kind of these things out there, but there's different kinds yeah i to me it's just like there are so many species of you look at everything that's on the planet earth like there's so many variations even within species you know what i'm saying so to to think that there's no diversity in that realm doesn't yeah. really add up uh, well and plus if you get the ufo component if they have manipulated the genome of your species on this planet how do you know what alien <laughs> And they're out there. Yeah. And they're here. So how do you know what messed with what? Yeah. To create what for what intention? You know, right. You, you don't know what the intent is. And we didn't know what the intent is was up there when these things were mouthing off and making their sounds. And why they were trying to communicate with me, like I was fortunate to record it that night in 1974, when they were actually started interacting with us while we we're outside the shelter. And they're trying to say something to me. I, I still don't know what it is. The crypto language just says it's a language, but he can tell one comes up and says ooga ooga and looks at a tree. You don't know that ooga ooga means a tree. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just that kind of a deal. So we don't know what they were trying to say, but they're trying to say something. And maybe it's just like so be on programs like this someday to talk about it because it, it's, uh, I think some of them can be uh, uh, bad, benevolent, but the, the, what we were dealing with, there wasn't. Yeah. So on that line of thinking, <laughs> a friend of mine who met you at a conference. I'm kind of putting you on the spot now. <laughs> I love it, but that's okay. He, um, his name is um, Justin England. He's the one of the hosts of Cryptids of the Corn. Oh yeah. yeah. Do you remember chatting with him? I he don't remember he, his face. I remember his name. I remember yeah, the, the, the event. He, but yeah. he told me to ask you about. Um, did you visit Portlock, Port Chatham? Oh, yeah. I, I was taken up there by the Discovery Channel uh, uh, production company. Uh, and yeah, I was up there, and I think I, they put me in episode four and five, or five and six. I'm not sure. So and you mentioned that they can be both good and bad. Is this a situation <sighs> where there's a connection? I know some people think that the stories of Portlock involve potentially like a, a malevolent Bigfoot. Oh, well, there's 30 some other people. 30 some of people were killed. That's why yeah. they abandoned the village. Yeah, yeah. I, I gave my advice, which they wanted me to tell them if it's safe to come back and rehabilitate re the village because they wanted to get the fishing going on again. But I said, well, you just got to show a little more respect, I think, for the property because when I flew over in the helicopter and they took me there, uh, I noticed they had really overlogged it years ago. It started growing up already, but uh, they'd overlogged it. And from the pictures I saw, uh, they were overfishing it too. I mean, it's really a good fishing area <laughs> at that time. And they were also mining area. So I guess got to imagine that if they were doing all that, like, like it looked like maybe they were, that they weren't respecting the property. You know, they were just, uh, they were infringing on this, these things territory. Mm -hmm. I got a feeling if, if these things were doing what they said they were doing, and it's a matter of record, they were killing people. And they said a Bigfoot-like creature. But they said it was like 15 foot tall. Wow. Like huge up there. And there are some that big, we made reported. And you got the other question, how does that stay out of our sight? How does it not become, uh, come on, I got that answer too. <laughs> I got my, <laughs> my idea of that answer anyway. <laughs> so, so are you willing to share that with me, or do I have to wait for the book? Well, there's a couple theories about it. No, no, you know, I'll share anything with you if I know it. If I think I know it, let's put it that way. Yeah. I don't know. I, no, there's a there's a, a theory that maybe some of them were, were uh, when they're in our environment, our 3D environment, they have to live by our 3D laws, which is everything measurable, predictable, you know, all that stuff where quantum physics is that way. So when they're in our world, and they like to be in our world because we got a good world here if we don't screw it up, and we are screwing it up, by the way. Yeah. Uh, they they abide by our rules, but I've heard that they uh, their pituitary gland they don't uh, they don't stop growing until they get out of this environment. And so the longer they're in here, the bigger they can get. Now, that's one theory. 
no theory of some of them are just bigger than others. <laughs> and it actually seems like the further north you go to, the bigger everything gets. I mean, yeah. I've been up, way up in Alaska, a lot of them. I had a guy up there years ago tell me he saw one disappear. Well, I threw him out just like I did. <laughs> he was a serious guy. I was at a board meeting. He was a you know, suit and tie guy. And he, uh, he said, I got to talk to you. So I saw one disappear from Buff Fairbanks. Well, there's also the, the theory that uh, the government has, has genetically modified uh, primates to, to, uh So there's a lot going on that different theories about this. Uh, also, there's a whole theory about these things going underground, which is possible too. A lot of people have gone underground. A lot of species have gone underground, I think. And there's, they go into Turkey and see those underground cities under them. They're all underground, dug out. <laughs> you got to wonder. I mean, there's, there's one in Turkey that's housed thousands of people. And my gosh. And that's that you can see pictures of that online. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, so they may go underground. Uh, but then, again, they're not all the same. So maybe some of them are staying up here and just able to uh, change their energy, their frequency, and go out of our sight and uh, be in another dimension. So if they have the ability to move through dimensions, you, you said that you think that they want to be here because we have a great planet. And there's plenty of resources for them. Do yeah. you think at some point when the human race goes too far and we're not respecting or we're not respecting yeah. our planet currently, do you think at some point they might make themselves known that they might start being more visible or have, <clears throat> or are they not supposed to interact with us? What are your thoughts on that? Well, they're not supposed to interact with us, but uh, they did with me, uh, I think what's going to happen is so much Bigfoot's going to come in. They will, but it's going to be the alien component is going to step in and do something because uh, they don't want us to destroy this planet. And we've almost gone too far already. So you know, all Putin's got to do is push that button, and you know, if nuclear war breaks out. They're going to they're going to try to stop that. I think they've already I think done some of that in the past. Well, do you think that's why it seems like lately there have been a lot more sightings of UFOs? Uh, UFOs, yeah, we're getting inundated with that. If you noticed, <laughs> we yeah, are. but I mean, nobody seems to care. <laughs> I know whether you're getting you're accustomed to it. So when they do make themselves known, it won't be a big shock. Yeah, and I think our government knows about it. I'm real sure about that. That's very interesting to me. That <laughs> I mean, it's just it's not big news. Well, <laughs> <laughs> to people, which is yeah. big news to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's big. Well, it should be big news because. If you even get into biblical uh, scriptures, which I, I was raised religiously, so I know biblical scriptures fairly mm -hmm. well and the history of how that happened. But uh, it says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it should also be in the, day, the last days. Well, the days of Noah is when the flood came, worldwide flood, you know, big catastrophe. And uh, that's when the aliens were intervening into the human genome, trying to corrupt it. And they wanted to take the planet and that's when the flood happened wiped everything out a lot of things went underground at that time uh so anyway that's kind of how got to start over again and so here we are again fixing the mess things up and you got native lore that says a lot of them they did take their women in so i think there's a dilution factor going on with some of them where they have crossbred interbred with uh with humans which would make some of them more human-like than others mm -hmm. And that's how I think the Patterson Gimlin film up there in Bluff Creek. Uh, that's what I think that is. It's more humanized. Uh, humanized. <laughs> I like that word. Humanized. Humanized. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> well, it, it it just had a footprint. Uh, its foot track is just very human-like. It's got mm -hmm. the arch in it, arch toes. Our our tracks were very splayed. Their bag that had five toes just right across the top like that. And we had those year after year, the same configuration. So. I think there was a difference there between what we had and what the Patterson film was. Yeah, which it makes sense, you know, that if they're in different areas, like you said, there's different variations of these things. You've done some research and travel to the Himalayas. You've been to Peru. Can you share with listeners kind of what those expeditions, the purpose behind those expeditions were and oh, sure. what your findings were? Well, all right. <laughs> 
I went to South America a couple of times with uh, uh, into Peru and uh, Bolivia, and uh, I flew over the Nazca lines. But I, I went down there and went. I was with a couple of scientists uh, investigating these elongated skulls. Brian Forrester is a man who lives in Caracas, Peru, and he took us to where some of them were, and we started looking at them, weighing them, and uh, they're like thirty percent larger than our skull, which they held thirty percent more brain matter. They were not cradle boarded like people say Incas did that. Well, the Incas did do that, but they did that to try to mimic what we think these pre Inca people did. But there's no sagittal suture in their head. Yeah. Because usually the plates, for people who don't know what that means, the, the skull or has parietal, parts. The parietal, yeah, that two parietal fuse. bones we have. Yeah. 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 And things are just different. You know, they're, they, they had two little pinholes in the back of their head. But they're not all the same either. <laughs> but there's a lot of them like that. I and mean, they're, they're all over down there. And uh, so Peru was a big eye opener for me because what we did find out is the uh, those big and megalithic structures up out of Cusco there, uh, which are put together 100 ton boulders uh, on this 13,000 foot mountain, put together like a jigsaw puzzle. And, and you, we can't do that today. I mean, it's just yeah. um, whatever did that uh, was advanced technology. And if people see that stuff with their own eyes, like I have, then you have to open your mind up to. There's more going on, has gone on here than what we think we we think we're King Kong, like I say, here on this planet. But uh, no, we're not. Yeah, and I <laughs> think our, the history maybe that we know is not not all there well, is. <laughs> history is written by the winners, you know. <laughs> it's written by the government that wants to keep control too. Yeah, and it's influenced by it has been since eons ago. Uh, every government has controlled the what they want you to know and what the narrative is going to be. Um, yeah, it's just the way it goes. So I think the government knows all about this stuff and they're just releasing so much and allowing so much to be released uh, to inundate us into what's going to happen. So it won't be such a big shock. Yeah, I, I'm curious as to why you think they have been keeping it quiet. Well, they want to control the narrative. If they can't control it, they won't let it out. <laughs> you know, if they can't control something, they don't want people to know about it. What do you think the implications of that being common knowledge would be for the human race? Well, we'll find out for long, probably. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I think that the whole world's fixing to have a flip here pretty soon. And I hope I'm around to be part of it or see it anyway and get this message out that we're talking about today because people need to be prepared for a mm -hmm. catastrophe again and what's going to happen. And do you think that? that knowledge when it comes to light that it will change humanity for the better that it will bring people together that it will it should bring us together but i don't know there's so much hate and killing and war going on now that it's just you need to imagine a world without that and if we all get together and start creating that because you can create a lot of stuff with your brain with your matter, yeah. your consciousness yeah. Back to and, quantum uh, physics. Yeah, yeah, and we're not doing, we're thinking negatively. We all live in a victimized, we think we're victims sometimes. And we need to get out of that and start raising our vibrational frequency, our level as a human species. And that'll help the planet to raise its level. And mm -hmm. everybody will get along much, much better. So I, I try to teach that the answer to all this is love and compassion. And if we have love and compassion for everything we do and ever, everything that happens, well, it's hard because it's like turn the other cheek. You know, it's hard to do. But if you realize how important it is, because we're all here just for experiences. That's all life is about here is as the experience. And we get to experience things so we can react to them. And if we don't learn to react with love and compassion, we're not going to raise ourselves to where we need to go. And energy doesn't die; it just changes form. That's physics. Mm -hmm. So. When that yeah. happens to us, we want to be into a, a better form and not have to come back. Because I believe in multiple embodiments. I just, I didn't, wasn't raised that way at all. But to me, it, it, it just has to be that way. We, we have to come back and respond to things we didn't respond to previously properly until we do all that and, and learn how to do that. But it's, it's so sometimes uh, hard to do. How do you think... Um... Well, first of all, obviously, you've had this journey that you've been on. You were one of the chosen people for some 
<laughs> for someone like oh, me. Never I've, had that. Some, <laughs> I've had some pretty strange experiences throughout my life and I actually live in Oregon now, but, um, that's, I, I having an encounter with Bigfoot is like <laughs> something I would love, but I don't know if, if I would be a chosen person, you know, some people are for whatever reason have these experiences and others don't, how would someone like me increase the chances of that happening? Ah, well, there you go. I think you got to raise your vibrational frequency so they can uh, match you and come into you and know that you're okay. You got to be where they're going to be and realize uh, that they can be wherever you, they want to be. <laughs> I mean, you can't make something happen. Yeah. Tell people that uh, we wasn't making something happen up there we had it's their terms and their time when they come around and uh i tell people i got a whole list of things that i that worked for us up there but you don't want to bring the wrong ones in and you got to know how to identify that and i think that's important because they might come in and tear your arms off like they did in portlock you also got the Paiutes saying about the love lock caves you know they they board with the cannibalistic giants there that's in sarah winnemucca's book so there are ones that just uh, want to eat you. <laughs> Those are the kind I don't want to run into. No, you don't want to. So you don't want to create that. But if you raise your personal frequency high enough, you're going to be okay. And I, again, I think there's a way to do that. A lot of it's through meditation, getting your, mm -hmm. your heart and your mind in coherence and having the pineal gland open. And uh, if it's open, uh, you can receive things from the universe. We're all one. One how, consciousness. How do you diminish the fear factor ah there's your big one that's the big one because fear is your only enemy and you just don't want <laughs> i'm the worst <laughs> no you can't be that way you just stop saying that part and you'll be uh, separate ahead of it already um just don't have fear i mean that's easier said than done i know especially when these things giants come around just sort of screaming or something uh, you have to replace it with love right just don't be afraid uh because we we got where we weren't afraid we was hoping they'd come around up there and that's when they started interacting with us and when they and i think they use fear in humans to uh intimidate us just to keep us away from hmm. wherever they want us that makes and sense yeah and uh same thing with throwing rocks you know if you a lot of rock throwing going on from out of nowhere but they don't ever hit anybody with them they just don't want you to go that way and uh it's uh it's a challenge to get your fear under control, but I've been up there by myself at this camp, and uh, that's that'll challenge you. <laughs> Were you in a like guru pose and meditating? <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no, I wasn't there, but uh, I, I went up there because Scott Nelson, the crypto linguist, wanted to get some more collaborative sounds, but nothing definitively would happen. I mean, things would happen, but nothing that you could really pin to the wall and say that's mm -hmm. a big foot, you know. Uh, oh, like I say, a lot of things happen, but again, nothing definitive. I got to have something definite before I'll say it's a big foot. And uh, we was up there three times during the summer of oh, 2012, I think it was. And uh, it was 11. I forgot. Anyway, a week at a time, we'd come out, shower, get some more food, and go back up again. And we got in pretty good shape because we was walking in. And that's a challenge to walk in and uh, go in. And then... Uh, he left, went back to his teaching job in Missouri, and uh, I thought, well, I wonder if they're up there because you know, I wanted more to happen, and uh, nothing really did. Nothing like I say, the chatter that we recorded and stuff like that didn't. Well, it did happen once, but Scott was asleep. My, then the story, <laughs> I punched him, and he's woo -hoo, and by then it stopped. You know. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, oh yeah, well, well, I went by myself, mm -hmm. and I, I thought I got to find out, so I went into camp. And I had uh, enough power bars last me for three days. Didn't even start a fire in the, in the fire right pit there. And I just uh, set up the little tent that we had because the shelter's been taken down. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, I heard a big crack right outside. This was in 2011. Yeah. But uh, I had been, I was by myself. I had a guy ready to go with me who was one of the heirs of one of the guys that wouldn't go back anymore. And uh, he backed out, so I went up by myself. Good shape, no problem. Packed my food in. Okay, power bars don't weigh a lot. Last for days on those. Well, there I am. It's daylight, and I hear this big. I, I, mosquitoes were so bad, I went inside this little tent I had set up to get away from them, started reading, and hear this big crack right outside. At the time, I thought it was a tree pop, you know, how they hit on trees. And they do hit mm -hmm. on trees, but 
But I also got another theory about that because Nate Valora says they live in trees too. They energize in trees, da, 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 da. I think they have a thing about trees. So now I backed away from that thing. And it was so loud and so close. It might've been just their energy coming out of a tree. I don't know, they, require, they require a lot of energy for what they do, changing matter into, uh, into energy. And uh, I sit in there for a minute thinking, wow, because that'll jerk the slack out of you, you know, when it's daylight. And I thought, oh, wow. So I wait a few minutes, I step outside the tent, and, and I started talking to them but by myself. Must have sounded like a little nutty up there, but I, I, I started talking to them. And, and I said, come on out, let me see. I just want to know more about you. I, I'm you know, not going to shoot at you or anything like that. I, I always carry a sidearm with me up there at least. But not to shoot at them. It's just... You know, I got a 52 inch rattlesnake band around one of my hats from up there too. And uh, there's also grouse, you might want to want those for dinner or something like that. So I keep birdshot in a couple of the chambers and and also we'll spook a bear off, you know, if a bear yeah. comes good enough for your food. Safety precautions. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not afraid of, uh, I'm not I'm not one of these guys that don't carry a gun, which is I, I carry a gun, but it's not for Bigfoot. I don't think that would have hurt them anyway. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, uh, I uh, anyway, I, I was talking about being there by myself, but this one in uh, 2011, I got to get back to because this was this was where I heard them chatter that night. I, 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 first of all, I got the tent. Nothing happened after I started. It was starting getting dark. And that's when you want to get it in something. You know, you don't want to stay out there by yourself. Nobody look over your shoulder. Nothing. So I got inside the tent and. Uh, Check my tape recorder out, you know. I got a brand new lithium battery. Check the uh, recorder works. Everything's fine. Got it all ready, and I lay down there, and I'm laying there. And all of a sudden, I hear this chatter about 10 o'clock that night, and uh, I said, "That's that's them. You know, that's just how they are. They're real rapid chatter." And uh, I hear this something tromping, bipedal walking, just right outside my tent, around the stove where I had it set up. You know, I didn't have a fire going. It was looking, I think, at the, now I didn't think about it at the time because I was just kind of wondering what I was going to do. It was looking for food because I've always left food up there out for them. Maybe. I got to speculate on that a little bit. And uh, whatever it was, I started talking to it again. I said, hey, I didn't want you to come back here in the dark. You know, I just had this little pea shooter 38 with me, two bird shot in it. <laughs> Not that, again, I wasn't going to shoot at them, but still... You just still don't know what they're all about. You know, you just don't know. And uh, so I it walked up, stood right by my tent, and that's it. I never heard it walk away, but it, it must have walked away. I laid there. I didn't get a lot of sleep that night. Four o'clock in the morning, I heard this metallic sounding. I can't even describe it. This metallic sounding sound going on out right outside my tent there. And that's all. I waited till daylight. I got up, put the tent up, packed up, and left because... <laughs> I, I found my answer. They are still yeah. around. So it's interesting. You said you heard it sounded like a, a loud crack. How loud are we talking? I'd say a gunshot going off right by your ear. Ooh. Yeah. And then the metallic sound, I feel like I've heard that come up in other people's um, stories with Bigfoot and possibly other interdimensional beings. Like that's a very common thing mm. that people say. I sometimes wonder if that is the actual, the portal opening. You know, that's another thought. Yeah, it might just be a portal. Because opening. when you have that, you think about like when a gun fires or anything like that, when you have that explosion, that it kind of like is like a, yeah, I don't really know how to describe it, but to me, it kind of makes sense that when our reality shifts, that there would be an accompanying sound because of that transfer of energy or that change in energy. Well, there certainly was a, a sound. <laughs> Don't Is know this for true sure. that you heard both? That you heard the pop? I heard different times, yeah. And then the well, metallic sound. Uh, same day, same night. Well, one was late afternoon, the other was four o'clock in the morning, the metallic sound. But there's been times I hear a big whooshing sound going on up there, like a big, huge tuning fork. And, uh, you look up at daytime, you can't see the source of it from anywhere. So what is that? Is that a, what is that? I don't know. Yeah, that's, I, I have, sort of have some theories about all of that, and I can't really wrap my mind around it completely because I'm not a scientist, but um, I'd like to get certain people in a room together that do have the knowledge because 
one of the things that we know is like granite is a, like one of the key components to some of the supposed I don't know if you want to call it paranormal or not normal activity and also like Yosemite has all these strange things that happen and mm -hmm. certain areas that are supposedly haunted and there's definitely something with the geology but I feel like there has to be a perfect combination of things for the electromagnetic you know the I just want to know what that combination is and if there was a way for us to test yeah. it it would be interesting to see like what the environment in this particular place a lot of boulders up by our camp and uh huge boulders any water nearby oh yeah spring right there by the, by the camp so that yeah. seems to be one of the combinations yeah. too and well, you then, have to have water yeah i know uh all the other animals whatever's around is totally quiet when these things are around yeah i don't know it's because they're feel like they're prey and they just don't want to make any noise <laughs> mm -hmm. but they yeah. they they mess with our deer because we're this is deer hunting camp but they've never taken it they've only taken what we've left out for them which excuse me so we'd usually off season we'd take you know, head mules I'd, I'd pack my mule and bill with too and we take our mules and spies up there and we take cans of spam and open spam and fry it on the grill. It smelled good and bacon. We take all that good stuff, you know. And, and uh, we leave some out for them. But that, they, they got used to that. So they would eat what we ate. But one time we went up there and we had some something left over from the time before. I forgot what it was, but some kind of meat that was just about rank. So at that time we thought well, they were kind of like a bear. You know, they'll eat anything. So we left it out for them. And uh, found it the next morning under a pile of dirt with a big hand <laughs> print. So They're like, I, no, thank you. <laughs> right. Well, something else went along with that. We left a jar of hot peppers open. <laughs> all those peppers were gone. You know, they never came back again that whole weekend we were there uh, after that night. <laughs> and we wondered if we didn't just really screw up the whole thing with all that. <laughs> I was going to say, they leave might be food, like... Leave them good food. Yeah. 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 How far away were were they from you when um, those recordings, the famous recordings, were made? How far away from your where you guys were in your, you know, shelter? Yeah. shelter? Well, yeah. it depends on which recordings you're referring to, but uh, I've I've laid there sometimes. I heard them walking right outside the shelter, just a few feet away. Um, Johnson saw one one time walking. He was about uh, probably fifteen feet away from the shelter. They're looking through a crack in the walls of the shelter and seeing it go by. As soon as one turned to the other one, said, "Hey, there's one." As soon as he said that, looked back. The thing was looking right at him, and he says, "Ten eight to ten foot tall." So wow. le left a nineteen inch track. So that gives us some kind of a idea of what size track they leave. We've had bigger tracks up there, and we also had a small track, a little nine inch track in the snow, and uh, along with an eighteen inch track, which we think was a mother and an adolescent. And I got I got that recorded one, not that specific one but uh that night when i got captured this what they call the samurai cry so one night i got to see one and he was up over here and he made that big cry and ran down to where the other two were the other two i think was an adolescent and a, and a female mother mm -hmm. and i think the adolescent because you can hear the little voice in the recording i got the little voice saying something and then a bigger voice coming down i'm like quit mess with these stupid humans <laughs> i don't know yeah i think the young ones are getting uh, are getting curious though about us and isn't that yeah. also like a right of kind of a rite of passage too, supposedly? Could be. That... I, I got that. Yeah, a lot of people got that theory. I do too. I think, <laughs> that, you know, I think when they do have a uh, young one in this environment, it's got to stay in this environment until it learns how to do what to interact and do. cloak and well, well, how all to, that. Yes, all that stuff. Yeah, the, um, the, the samurai chatter, that piece of audio, it, it very much sounds like a couple arguing. A female and a male kind of arguing. Well, they they were arguing. I think at one <laughs> yeah. time we just didn't know if they was arguing over salt and pepper to put on us, or if they was arguing over the food we left. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, not even knowing what they're saying, just hearing it, I feel like you can hear. You can hear that. You don't have to know what they're saying. It's just <sighs> the way that they're interacting is, yeah. you know. So maybe yeah. they were like the little one was trying to get too close, and <laughs> the mom. Well, then you get it. some people that says they can they can mimic those sounds themselves, or uh, you know, like 
like to call out Joe Rogan on that one because he thinks he can, he thinks they're all phony, you know, but he has no idea what the history is. He didn't do his homework on it. But anybody that does their homework on these things, you know, the studies I've had done through, through uh, Dr. Curlin and through mm-hmm. uh, crypto linguists and also what Dr. Lieberman has to say about it. Because Dr. Lieberman is Brown University. He, uh, he was a, a scientist, a cognitive speech scientist on primates. And he just passed away last July, but he, uh, he said that only humans have the vocal mechanism for language. Well, these things have language, which puts them in, they got to have a human component. Yeah. And I, I come right out with that now because that's a fact. Uh, well, we record anyway. I'm not sure they all have that ability to speak like, like these do. But I've had a lot of people report to me that they heard the samurai chatter, they call it, uh, different places in Ontario, yeah. up in Canada, they, they hear it. And anyway, it's, it's a fun life. Uh, what I've been doing, it's, I've been all, all over uh, researching this thing too. And the Sierra Camp is a special place. So. Do you still go up there? I've been up there since 2018. That's when David Pilates uh, uh, mm-hmm. came up there to do the filming of that hole when the missus yeah. uh, hunted. Yeah. And uh, actually, it was on fire hole. That's what all California was on fire at the time. And uh, we came out not sure if we were going to get out because we was up there for a full week doing that filming. and. And, uh, but I flew over it later on, uh, in a small plane and looked it over and it looked like the whole area right there where our camp is, it was, the trees weren't burned up. So maybe it just under burned, you know, it didn't burn mm-hmm. at all. I don't know. I don't know of anyone that's been up there since then, because I don't know that the Johnsons still hunt up there. Uh, I don't know. It's a pretty imposing trip. Number one. And if you're not in shape, you better take a horse that knows the trail too, or you'll he'll panic too and hurt you (laughs) yeah yeah so with uh david visiting what are your thoughts on that connection between bigfoot and the missing 411 do you have an opinion on that uh i don't think they're doing it i think aliens are doing it number one uh because there's a lot of people that have implants after they've been supposedly abducted and uh there's a lot of reports of people being abducted i don't know that bigfoot has anything to do with it other than Bigfoot may be part of that whole program, not not the abduction so much, but just they're part alien. And uh, maybe aliens created them, which I think aliens created us. You really want to get into it. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, that would stand to reason. Like, we're not that not, yeah. not that different, really. Well, and, and uh, what alien did it, for what purpose? You know, we were created, I think, by a very high frequent, frequential being, God, if you want to say that. And uh, those beings, and I say plural because God is plural, that's a fact. <laughs> That's hard to get across those, talk to especially religious people. Uh, but high frequency beings, I think they're from really a high profile, ninth dimensional entities. Uh, what we're dealing with up there, are probably a fifth dimensional. And that's what most aliens are, I think. Uh, I think it's a it's an area that we can get to. We can get to it, and if we just and we get to it in this in this life, if you just learn how to meditate and learn how to do what the gurus do and what the uh, shamans do sometimes mm-hmm. no drugs involved but up there that we had no drugs involved no none of that stuff went on but uh i think a lot of people can get on some of these uh, psychedelic drugs and uh, trigger that in their cells and see god yeah <laughs> i, think, I mean you, you, know you, you I mean? hear about dmt <clears throat> i mean that's a classic right experience for people but again it's connected to the pineal gland and I think so. I think your pineal gland is your receptor for everything. And, and uh, you, I mean, I'm not talking about everything. I'm talking about your ears are that for audio things in this dimension. But the things from the universe to receive, you just have to meditate, let the pineal gland be open and download all that into the heart, which has its own brain. Once mm-hmm. your heart and your brain up here, this one gets in coherence and the right rhythm. And that's done through frequency balancing your chakra, you might want to call it. And when that happens, uh, I think you're you're on your way to having a pretty good life and start treating everything with love and compassion. And you don't get sick anymore either, by the way. That's a pretty good uh, benefit. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I've seen recently, too, where, t- you know, you talk about acoustics and frequency, all of that in the Quantum Bigfoot book. I saw something recently where, um, you know, even the use of acoustics to raise those stones, like you were talking about, like the technology to be able to do that and to cut the stones. 
yeah. totally possible. Totally possible. Well, I think so. I think it's been through vibrational frequency. And uh, actually, it was it uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell said uh, uh, it takes classical and quantum sciences together to have clear perception. Think about that. You know, most researchers are just using classical science only. And can't see it; it's not there. Well, they're they're hurting themselves by limiting themselves like that. And uh, quantum science, according to Doctor uh, Christopher Breyer at West Texas A and M, says that everything from the atom throughout the cosmos works in accordance with the laws of quantum physics. Well, you put that together, and you know, it, all it does is right on the back of what we already know in, in the Newtonian physics world, but you got to get into what's really going on in, in, in us and in this world, how things really work, and things really work through the laws of quantum physics. And you don't see it at the micro level, but it works throughout the micro level too. It works whether we want to believe it or <laughs> that's true. Yeah. You know, it's 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 happening. So, what is there one thing that you would like to see? happen in your lifetime with respect to these beings with respect to the beings uh i think pe they're doing well without our <laughs> our input i think people need to recognize uh what they uh, what they could be and their product of what i've been talking about here uh, alien intervention or just a really common that's that's evolved which could be uh learn from this, what we could be as humans, because we have not been shortchanged. We've been given everything by our creator. We just haven't learned to evolve into it yet. We have to learn how to do that. You do that through love and compassion. I gotta keep going back to that because that's that's what I believe. I'm not a religious person anymore, but I'm spiritual like we all are. Like it or not, you're spiritual. This body is gonna give up someday and your consciousness is gonna go somewhere else and be something else. So you just want that to be as good as it can be. And uh, that's what I'd like to, to happen is people. My message, if it's if it's on track and the more I get into it, then this next book I'm coming out with is going to get into it even more. But uh, if my message is correct, I just hope it, it, it fits with people and they understand it. Because uh, I'm trying to write it in layman's terms. Mm -hmm. And uh, that makes a difference, I think. People say, oh, quantum physics, that's way over my head. Well, no, it's not, you know. I'm not, I'm not a genius, <laughs> and it's not over my head. <laughs> Makes just, sense uh, to me. I read I just, that. <laughs> I just want people to to uh, get a handle on on what's coming for this planet, and uh, I hope it happens in my lifetime. I don't know how long I'll live, but uh, just be ready for anything. We're being inundated. We're being uh, information is being released. If you guys had heard, if they could have heard what I heard on David Pilates this last weekend from the people that he interviewed, there's so much going on. He had FBI agent there. He had people that retired from FBI, people retired from law enforcement, from special agents, things like that. <laughs> and uh, you hear these stories about how much the government really conceals, and you you just wonder. You don't wonder. I don't wonder. But they don't give out something they can't control. They can't control aliens because it's out of their. Yeah, right? it's yeah, beyond their, their <laughs> beyond their capability, really. Beyond. Well, they, yeah, and they've known that since you know when they found out they knew Roswell was not a weather balloon, right? <laughs> yeah. So, where can people keep up with what it is that you are doing? When is your new book coming out? Where can people find it when it does? <sighs> I'm hoping to have my book out by uh, my next convention is not till April. I got two in April, and uh, I'm off now till through December, so for broadcasts and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. uh, so probably, uh, well, ronmorehead.com is my website, and that's one o m o r e h e a d dot com. And uh, my books are all that I have now are all downloadable, and so are my CDs, which has the sounds and all that. And uh, the new book, I just hope to have it out by April. Uh, it's it's all, it's a challenge because I a lot of homework in that stuff to get everything right so that you're not off on some weed track, you know. Are you allowed to share the title? I don't know the title yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I no, I've had change it two or three times. Every time I write another chapter, I think, well, that's it. I'm going to put the title on when I finish it. 
yeah that makes sense <laughs> it will have the word bigfoot in it though. <laughs> just well, because you are going to basically take further what you did in quantum bigfoot you're going to bring that to another level you're going to dive deeper I'm going to answer some questions that was not answered in that one. Okay. First of all, CERN, 2012, established physically that the um, energy and, and matter are interchangeable. And that was, like I say, Dr. Dirac, uh, in 1933, got the Nobel Prize for antimatter, which established that too mathematically. It was established physically. So, hands down, <laughs> energy and matter, which we are, are interchangeable. And people say they can't disappear. Well, yes, they can disappear. All they got to do is have the frequency right to change their matter into energy. And I'm I'm of a theory here, which I'm working on, uh, that that they can do that through the vocal mechanism. It's so expensive, so much more than what we have. Uh, maybe they just do it through their sounds. I don't know, but so many things. That, you know. Well, yeah, that makes sense to me too. Because if you think about when you hear a certain sound and a vibration, it does move through your body. You can feel that physically infrasound, infrasound, affect, right. yeah, affect your body. And I've even, I even saw something recently where um, they were using sound to heal disease. Oh and, yeah. And reverse my, disease. My wife so. is a sound energy worker. I'm Reiki certified as well. So, so is she, yeah. <laughs> She's got all the tuning forks and everything else, too. Yeah. To help people with sound. Because you get on the right frequency, and she has to get inside you, feel you anyway, to know what's wrong. And then when she, she establishes what's wrong, then she can get the right vibration to, to work with yeah. you. And, Is uh, that, um, you had mentioned that in your book as well, the principle of resonance. Can you explain to listeners what that what that means? Well, it's balancing, balancing the frequency with the issue and uh, making it work. And I think that's what I mean. And also, you had mentioned, too, like, the principle of resonance. Like, if you hit, like, a tuning fork, and then you have one that is next to it, this tuning fork will match up with the resonance of this fork, correct? Well, they get, uh, maybe they get coherence. I'm not sure what I said there. Now. <laughs> I wrote that book in... But that was my takeaway. That was my takeaway. <laughs> All right, good. Which, which is interesting, which means that, yeah, you can, if, if these beings have the ability to manipulate these frequencies, that they also would have the ability to manipulate your frequency or the frequency yeah, and around you. A lot of people you. say that they can heal them, that they've healed people, or they wow. do that through frequency. Uh, there's so much going on. I mean, there's so many things to do with this. Their vocal. I think it's all about the vocal mechanism and, and what they have and what they're trying to tell us how we can be. Not that we have the vocal mechanism to do that, but we, if we get on the right frequency, uh, it's all intent to. We have a consciousness. We've been given the knowledge of good and evil, of good and right from wrong. I don't think aliens have that so much. <laughs> I don't know about Bigfoot, but uh, uh, we have a consciousness that... Uh, that was given to us by our creator and it's uh it's important for people to understand who they are as a human being we're very very lucky very privileged to be in this experimental stage which we are like i say all life is about experiences how you react to the experiences more than the experience itself so that's my <laughs> that's my giveaway there <laughs> well thank you so much i really have enjoyed having you on the weird wilderness and I look forward to the next book. I loved Quantum Bigfoot. That was great. It, it lines up with a lot of kind of my thoughts on having a better understanding of what these beings are and why they are so elusive and how they have the ability and attributes that they do. Yeah. So. I don't think I don't think anything is supposed to interfere with our choices. We all have free choice. Always will have. Everything has free choice. Yeah. And what we choose is what's going to establish who we are mm -hmm. and uh, how we're going to be in the hereafter, wherever that is. Uh, but nothing's supposed to interfere with our choices. So if uh, you hear people say that these things can mind speak, well, if they get on your frequency, yeah, they lead you to, but you don't know that you think of that or if it's something else. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's so real to you, you got to believe it. And you know, I always try to think, well, that comes from, because people ask me, do I ever get mind speak when I was up there? I never looked for it. It was so 
over our heads at the time. Everything about this world that I'm living in now is over my head then. <laughs> you know, I wasn't looking for that stuff. Uh, so can they mind speak? I think if you're on the right frequency with the right attitude, you'll, you'll catch something. But then that's through your, your pineal gland. You know? mm -hmm. if, you, if you learn how to receive, so many people just think they can pray for something and have it happen. Well, it's not going to happen unless you're in coherence, unless you get the, the intent inside your heart, uh, then things will happen for you. But you have to have that yeah. intent. You have to get all that things, everything flowing through you, and get the karma, get the sound, all of it together. It's like I write in my book. I don't, I don't believe religions are wrong at all. They're, they're good, good thing to have. But they don't teach spirituality as much as I think some of them should. It's a good social thing. So what is the best way for someone to become more spiritual, more enlightened? Meditation. Do you think it's meditation? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Just be still. Be still. Let it happen. Don't make it happen. Let it happen. And you do that, just be calm, be quiet, be still, and let your mind be open, and you get things come to you. You know, you get that gut feeling sometimes, you know, where you just get a feeling. Well, your brain needs to work with that because <laughs> your brain has to tell your body what to do. Mm -hmm. Your heart tells your brain what to do. So go by your gut feeling a lot instead of the brain. Your brain is too analytical. Mine is, anyway. It wants to do things on its own. <laughs> I think we I think we all suffer from that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do, but that makes us human. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, where are you going to be in April? What You said you got a couple oh, conventions. Oh, I see. I'm going to be, yeah, I got one here in North Carolina, and I got one in Florida. Okay. Yeah, uh, one's the 1st of April. Why they do on April Fool's Day, I don't know, but they did. <laughs> and I, where is that? Oh, I can't think of the name of the town now. Anyway, it's in North Carolina, and, uh, and the other one is in uh, in Florida. That's the 24th, I think, of April. If you ever do any investigations in Oregon, you might have to let me know. I just I'm came in... back from there. I was there. Uh, yeah, where were we at? I was in Cottage Grove, and I was in Washington, and I was had a, two two production companies that met with me there and wanted to film me and get some interviews. And... Nice. And I got yeah. two daughters. I got two daughters out there too. So. Okay, so then uh, you're an Oregon regular. It sounds well, I like. I wanted to talk about that Min McMinnville thing that you're close That's to. That's where I'm at. I know. Yeah, and I. But uh, I guess I'm just not into it good enough yet. <laughs> I would like to speak at their convention there sometime. Oh, I think yeah. That I'm not because now that Davis come out with this film, I think it puts Bigfoot and UFOs somewhat together. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've put them together for a while, and I think what I've got is is this talking is is a language of their own, whatever it is, and it's it's alien. Yeah, we've had sightings of both. Um, I lived in McMinnville for a while, and now I live in a smaller town close by, but still in Yamhill Valley. And one of the most famous photographs of a UFO was taken in McMinnville, and you know they have the big yearly parade that they do, and. Right. There have been quite a few Bigfoot sightings in this area, too. And I think Kalakamish oh. is like one of the highest. Oh, that was my stomping ground. You know, it was uh, Washington, Oregon, in Northern California. Mm -hmm. And uh, yep. yeah, I was part of the Olympic project when I was there. I've only been here about a year. And uh, prior to that, I've been on the West Coast all of my life. There's plenty of it out here, I'm sure. There is. <laughs> I was so surprised that there's so much of that stuff going on back here. I mean, I spoke at a couple this year, and there's thousands there, not just hundreds, there's thousands. Where you're at? Yeah. Well, in wow. North Carolina. Yeah, in Kentucky and um, Blue Mountains, uh, those conventions back there. And packed well, out. Ohio's like one of the biggest states, isn't it? For it's sighting? It's a lot there in Salt Fork. Yeah, I spoke back there a couple times, but it's been a long time since I've been there. Mm -hmm. but yeah, there's a lot of sightings there at Salt Fork area, and uh, uh, they're just being seen a lot. And you brought this up earlier when you when we was talking about why they're being seen so much. Well, they are multiplying, and and we're in, encroaching more into the forest as we populate. And so, I think we're just going to see more and more of them because I think they're becoming more and more bold. And uh, but again, if they go out of your sight, just Knock it down and say, okay, that happened. <laughs> but it can happen. You know, we see within certain frequencies. 
yeah, there's a group somewhere nearby here, um, a group of loggers that had an experience recently. Um, I found out through a local, like a Facebook post, and it was one of the wives that was talking about it, but she said none of them will talk about it. None of the guys. She said it was well, so scary. Of Earth, so well, afraid. and yeah, that, and I think whatever the experience was, it scared them. I don't know the details of it, but I mean, there was like <clears throat> five of them that witnessed whatever it was that they witnessed. Well, I'd like to know who they were. I could Me I know too. people back there that would research uh, thoroughly and. Me too. Well, Peter, have... li Peter lives on Pacific. You know where Pacific City is. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. where Peter Byrne lives. He's a good old friend of mine. I went into Paul with him. But that was a fun trip. It was very fun. <laughs> what did you find out? Oh, I don't nothing. Oh, I found out how to track a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was on an elephant, and no, not to get between a, a couple of rhinos that are. Uh, yeah. Really Oof. <laughs> I was taking a picture of this one rhino on top. I was on an elephant by myself, just me and the guy there. And I get a picture of him. We're pretty close. And I start taking a picture. And this other one right over here, the female, screams. That elephant reared up like this. Like, oh, no. Oh, that little basket I made, you know. And that elephant just takes off running. <laughs> I'm trying to get a picture of all the chases. <laughs> and we ran into a 19-foot restrictor snake uh, back there, too. Oh, my gosh. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was back there a month, and uh, it was fun. But anyway, no Yeti. No story. Yeti? Not Yeti. No, not Yeti. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, the Bhutan up in there, well, it's a little story, too, but 17,000 feet on these uh, tracks, bipedal tracks. Did uh, you? No, I didn't. But this, uh, this, this people did. But Geo Natho Geographic sponsored them, and they went up there. Had a geneticist there, and they got the eDNA out of the uh, tracks, and it was uh, showed out to be the mitochondria was human, ninety nine percent human, and then you got the Melba Ketchum, who's the United States uh, geneticist, and she said that they got human DNA in them, and so most academic just put the thumbs down because well, if they got human DNA, they must be contaminated. Well, no, it's just that they are part human. And that I've established that through just my studies. You know, they are part human. Or we're part Bigfoot. I'm not sure which. Could but be. we're different. We're different in that we were created by something different. I I, I get rallying too much here. So you're out of time. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. And I look forward to checking out your next book and seeing all these revelations that you're going to come up with and continue. Well, I hope it's that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's nothing. Uh, I shouldn't say that. I, I almost said it's nothing new, but it will be something new to the people that are following this. Yeah. Because it answers a lot of the questions. How do they, how do they disappear? How do they do what they do? Uh, more so than the other book. Uh, yeah. And I think that's, when there are so many people that are skeptical about it, they want the science. They want. Well, and this is what that's what I know? base it on because quantum science, uh, as far as paranormal goes, they're not synonymous. Uh, paranormal is things that pseudoscience, what you think happened, your your assumption and your speculation toward. Quantum science, I think, answers a lot of the paranormal things that happen. And that's that's how I define the difference. So I think that's important. Because people want to call you woo woo or you know, or you're paranormal. Well, that's not what I am. I'm a, I'm a citizen scientist, citizen physicist. I guess you call me. <laughs> All uh, right. Yeah. Well, Good on time. that note, I will let you to the rest of your day. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Talk to you again, Heidi. Thank All you. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Take care. Bye.